Well, I was born 1931 in New Rochelle, New York, 5.30 in the morning. Okay. And uh, I was living in Hartsdale, New York, which is fairly close to where New Rochelle is. And uh, it was my grandfather's estate in Hartsdale. I was living there with my mother and father. And we lived there for a while and then we moved to Florida. And my father and mother uh, had a place down there and my father did a lot of fishing down there. I remember my mother saying at one time she had to keep me penned up because I was always roaming around. And she put me in a pen with a door on it, that closed, and I couldn't open it. And I didn't like that very much. I remember that, but very little else uh, of that time. But uh, eventually we moved out of Florida. We moved back north. Uh, and we lived at that time I think of my father's, my grandfather's estate in Hartsdale for a while. He had several houses there. And uh, I don't remember too much. I remember a lot of very expensive cars that were always around and a lot of horses. This my grandfather was. Uh, very fond of animals and horses especially. And he had polo ponies and jumpers and uh, all sorts of different uh, breeds. And my mother was uh, a very good rider and she, uh, she used to uh, ride in the uh, Madison Square Garden occasionally. And then, as I got older, <clears throat> I must have been five or six, my father and mother bought some land in, uh, on Pines Bridge Road in Oh, what's the name of the town now? Austin, Austin. And uh, it was just off the Tacoma Parkway. In New York? In New York, yes. And uh, my father built a big house there with a, a, uh, an architect friend of his name, Ed Lodi. And I, I remember seeing the building being built it took about two years for it to be finished. And we lived down the way about half a mile away from where the house was being built. Uh, and I remember that area very clearly. I was old enough then to remember things. But I used to go over to the building, the building site where our house was being built. And it was quite a, a, an amazing thing to watch it being built. My father had built a, a, a small model of the house on the land. And so I kind of watched it all happen as the, the, the whole time went through. And how old was you then? I was about uh, four years old. And then when did you first start uh, showing interest in art and painting? Oh, that didn't happen until later. Uh, I, I, I was, my sister was born a little after me. So my sister and I spent a lot of time together. Uh, and we became very close. 
and uh, the area we lived in was all fields, all uh, farmland mm -hmm. that had uh, gone to seed and it was all just acres and acres of, of tall grass and weeds. And next to the house that my father built was a big golf course, uh, which uh, was being used all the time. And we would go over there and explore the countryside on the uh, golf course area. And behind the house, and we would walk back into the woods and find old artifacts and things that were left there from past farmers who lived in that area. The house finally got done and we moved into it. It was quite expensive for those days. Uh, it was $25,000 at that time, which was in the 30s. Mm -hmm. In the early 30s, about 30, 35, 36, 37. And, uh, and you lived in that house for how long? Oh, about six or seven years, maybe a little longer. But uh, that was my home for a while. And, uh, my father would shoot pheasants back in, in the fields behind the house. Mm -hmm which my mother didn't enjoy. Uh, and uh, my father had a shop there, which he did a lot of different things. Uh, I didn't know what they were, but uh, he kind of, kind of instructed me in different things about how to sharpen things. Uh, knives and such, and uh, I spent a great deal of time out in the fields there with my sister. And uh, we had a tree, a big apple tree in the in the on one side of the house near the garage of the house. And there was a configuration in the tree at the bottom. And there was something that looked like a thumb. And I looked at it a long time. And I figured it was God's thumb. Hmm. And, uh, and somehow that connected and it became a personal thing of mine. Uh, this is God's, I would show people God's hand coming out of the tree. Wow, that must have been an amazing sight. Yeah, and I had a dog named Annie. She was a big Irish sweater. And she was my companion. And a good dog. I remember her very well. So you stayed in that house for about six or seven years or so? Maybe a little longer. And then... You, you basically grew up in New York, though, most of your childhood? Uh, all my childhood. And then do your probably adolescent years? In my adolescent years, yeah. But we moved a lot. Uh, my father built this house, and uh, it became very difficult to pay the mortgage. Mm -hmm. And the house was beautiful. It was a French provincial type. Uh, building and uh, it was made of mostly concrete and it was painted white and uh, I went to school at Ostening finally when school came up around six or seven years old I went to uh, school there and we had a woman that worked for us she lived with us. Her name was Mrs. Rivers. Mrs. Rivers. She was a black woman. Very nice woman. And she take, took care of us children. And by that time, there was 
is uh, Michael, me, Michael, and Juliana. And uh, no other children came at that time. But we lived in that house until we sold it to um, Rosemary Clooney and Jose Ferrer. He was not an actor. Hmm. And we sold it to them. I love the place. And I was sorry to leave it. And we moved from uh, Pines Ridge Road in Austin to Austin, New York. And, uh, and that was that probably time, the late 30s or? That was the late 30s, yeah. And uh, I began to show an interest in painting. More, more or less, I was interested in sculpting things out of clay. And that's what I was playing with a lot. And uh, I guess my mother realized that I had something going on that the other kids didn't quite have. So she encouraged you to? She encouraged me, yeah. She was very good that way. And we lived in Austin for well, about two years, two or three years. And uh, that's why I was in elementary school. And I remember painting a big painting at the school. By that time I was becoming kind of recognized as somebody who was doing something with the uh, with painting and creative uh, aspects. So your first, your very first painting was probably around the age of 10 or so. Yes. Okay. I would say even before that. Even before that? Yeah. And my sister, Juliana, followed suit with me. She was painting also. But they didn't think she had quite the same qualities that I had. At that time, I was kind of... I was a little bit confused about life and and my friends that I met and all sorts of things of that nature. And uh, I liked the country very much. It was on the Taconic Parkway where our house was right off the Taconic Parkway. I remember that house very well because it had big maples around it which in the fall, the place was covered with leaves and we'd break the leaves up and build a fire and cook potatoes hmm. on the fire, on the, on, with the, uh, the, the burned leaves. And uh, I would go back into the woods and find, I found a little stream back there and I found there were fish in the stream and I was fascinated by the fish. I didn't know what kind of fish they were, but it interested me very much. And uh, and we lived there, by, as I said before, we lived there about two or three years. And uh, I came down with a heart murmur, which uh, the doctor said I shouldn't go to school. So I spent a year at home while everybody else went to school. Mm -hmm. And I, I just had my own little room and I used my mother's room as a studio. It would, well, it would be called a studio, but it was really just a room. And I was creating little forests with the clay and animals making animals and all this. And my mother uh, enlisted me at the, uh, the county center in White Plains, which is fairly close by. 
and I worked there. I wor I worked with Clay there. And uh, I went through that year. I was all right. I was all right. I finally had to have an operation. I had to have my tonsils taken out of my adenoids all that kind of stuff, because I hated that. Because I remember when I was very small in Ossony, I had to have a, uh, I, had to have, I had a circumcision done on me, which uh, I didn't understand why I had it done, but I was very frightened of the ether that was used. Mm -hmm. That the ether scared the hell out of me. And I remember they, they put the mask over me and I was screaming and I didn't realize very much after a minute I was out. So I went for this operation at uh, later on for the adenoids and for the, uh, the uh, my tonsils. And I went through the same process there. I realized I was going to have ether again, which I hated. It was a terrible experience the first time. And I really resisted this time. I got underneath the bed of the hospital and finally scooted out of there and ran up the hallway, up to the top of the building and ran into a, a dead end. There was a hallway that went nowhere, and there in front of me was a window. <laughs> and of course, everybody was following me or trying to catch me. I was about 10 years old, and uh, I was just freaking out. And Dr. Bloom, the doctor that had operated on me for a circumcision when I was very young, uh, came out of the thing. He had, he was in a wheelchair, and I remember him being very friendly to me. He says, "Hi, Michael, how are you?" And I said, "I don't like what's happening." And he says, "I know." <coughs> well, they finally got. They just grabbed me and took me into the operating room. Me screaming my head off, and they put me under the oper oper on the operating table and gave me the ether again, uh, and I was out. And the next thing I remembered, I woke up later on in my bed in the, in the, in the hospital. And uh, it was very frightening, the whole thing. Well, very soon after that, we left Briarcliff and we moved to Newburgh. Newburgh, New York, which is on the Hudson River. And uh, we lived in a little town outside of Newburgh called Vales Gate. And uh, that's where we stayed for another four years, I think. It was a beautiful, beautiful home with a barn where my father wrote. And the property is all hemmed in by this big these bushes that were about 15 feet high. And it was gorgeous. I remember that place. And my father had a garden there. And Annie was alive. And that's where she died. She was hit by a car at night. And my father picked her up and brought her home. And we buried her in the back in the backyard. We have about we had about five acres there, so and it was all farmland. And uh, I would I would go hunting with my father occasionally, and uh, and he was writing. He always was writing in his studio uh, a great deal of the time. And I fished a lot. You know, I went to different streams around there and caught eels and sunfish and other fish, small bass and this and that. And uh, my sister and I kind of lived like natives. We lived all summer out there, practically with no clothes on, just creating our own life, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went 
went to school there, a little private school that was very strange. Hutchinson River Private School. Hutchinson River Private School. And uh, I stayed there for a year or two. Well, it was a year, maybe a, just a year. But uh, the, the owner of the school was very strict and his wife was very strict. And they were at a school there. A lot of the people were boarders. People that stayed all the time there, young people. And uh, I didn't like that school for some reason. I didn't like the owner. Uh, I don't remember his name. But I knew the children and I was drawing all the time. Uh, and I was kind of, kind of known for that for the kids around me. I would draw for them, I would draw for myself, I would draw whatever. And uh, we stayed in Newburgh for at least, at least two years. And we knew some of the farmers around there and they were very friendly and nice. And uh, they were quite doing very well. Their farmers were, they were thriving and their cows were doing well. And, you know, they were milking and collecting hay in the summer and corn and whatever else. And, uh, and Vales Gate was just a tiny little town, just had a post office and a general store. And that was it. And so I hardly knew anybody there. But we stayed in Austin until, I remember uh, it was 1941, December 7th, 1941, when uh, uh, the Japanese invaded Honolulu. And I remember that day very clearly. And it wasn't too soon after that that I began to see trucks moving up and down the highway full of soldiers. They were beginning to form armies for the Second World War, mm -hmm. which was on. And our neighbors were German people they lived next door. They had a big um, farm with, uh, they just raised rhubarb. Acres and acres of rhubarb. And they had a white horse. And he, ra he ran this little, this little farm and just raised rhubarb. And they had four children. Little German blonde, little drop blonde children. And they played with us. Uh, they were kind of new to the whole country, though. Uh, but it was interesting to talk to them because I was trying to show them how to shoot a bow and arrow, and they didn't know how to do that. <laughs> uh, so that was life in Newburgh. I was a very shy boy. I was drawing all the time. And my father was encouraging me, my mother was also. And uh, Mrs. Rivers was still with us. She stayed with us for 15 years. Wow. She lived with us. She was part of the family. Mm -hmm. She's a lovely, lovely woman. And she would feed us. She would make sure we were well fed. And uh, she took care of that. She never, I used to ask my father, I says, why isn't she eating with us? And when she says, well, she doesn't like to eat with us. She likes to eat by herself. I didn't realize the difference between black and white, really. It didn't matter to me at that time. Mm -hmm. it, didn't, it didn't seem very important. Yeah. And it wasn't. 
but Mrs. Rivers lived with us until we left, well, we left Newburgh finally, we moved back down to Westchester County and we moved to Scarsdale. And Scarsdale, by that time I was, oh, 12, 13, you know, I was on early teens. And I went to the public school there and I didn't like it. I did not like it. They kept saying, your clothes are spotty and dirty. I said, they're clean. And they said, they're still spotty with paint spots and whatever else on them. So my family realized I wasn't going to make it in the, high, in the public school. I just wasn't doing it. And they put me in the school in White Plains called Windward Day School, which is a school for slightly disorganized children and children. But uh, some of their friends went to the school, and I knew some of their children, their children. And so I knew the ch some of the children at the school, and I stayed at school for two years, and it was one of the best schools I ever went to. It was a marvelous school. They gave you more freedom to kind of paint and draw? And yeah, yeah, and they knew. They really encouraged me. And we had, we did uh, Shakespeare plays. We did two or three Shakespeare plays a year. Uh, we had art classes. Of course, I had, we had the academics, which I wasn't very good at. And we had lunch, and I remember after lunch, we'd all go to the library and read for an hour. And that was more or less the day there at Woodward. And I knew many, many uh, people there. They became lifelong friends of mine. Uh, one boy named Ron Meikle, uh, is somebody I still know. Here I'm nearly 90 years old, and I know this guy since I was 12 years old. Wow, it's a long time. <laughs> yeah. But we remained friends all those years. And Patty Fink, they were very close friends of my family, uh, Patty Fink, the Finks. And her father was a commercial artist, a very good artist. And uh, I, I went to school with Patty for a couple of years. And uh, we, we, I knew Patty for a long time before that. I used to go over and spend the, the evening and sleep with her. And we were just young children, and we just, but we had a hell of a good time together. And we stayed in Scarsdale for about five years. We lived in three different houses. We lived on Cush Cushman Road, and then we moved up onto the hill on a, in a big Victorian house. A beautiful old house with marvelous trees around it. And we lived there, there for about a year or two, about two years. And then from there we went to uh, a place that was near the border of Scarsdale and White Plains. And that's when I went to uh, Woodward. I would pick, I would get the bus there and it would take me to, in the White Plains and then I'd catch another bus and that would take me out to the school. And that was my, my daily kind of experience. I'd go to school all day and come back to the, in the late afternoon. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then where did you go to high school at? I went to high school at, uh, oh, then we, we moved back to New Rochelle. My family moved a great deal mm -hmm. because of financial uh, problems. My father was a, a very bright man. He was a writer. He wrote short stories. Mm -hmm. He was a journalist. A good one. Very good. 
but he hated New York. He hated going in on the train to his father's uh, business. But his father ran a public relations business, and he ran it in the Rockefeller Center. And besides that, he had offices in Rome and and Puerto Rico and other places. And it was a, an active uh, public relations office. It was before the war ended. And I would sometimes go to the movies and they'd have these small uh, kind of things on Hamilton Wright, which is my name. And my Hamilton was my grandfather's name. He was my father's father. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were movies on whatever he was doing for whatever country, whether it's Puerto Rico or so one of the other Caribbean countries. And they would be on bananas or they'd be on some other item that they were selling. Mm -hmm. And there'd be these small movies before the main movie. And I was told that I said, Hamilton Wright, I said, that's my grandfather running that thing. So you lived in New York most of your life then? I'd, uh, or, uh, yes, most, most of, of my your early life. years, yeah. Yeah, most of my young life. Uh, we moved from Scarsdale to New Rochelle, <coughs> and we lived on Hamilton Avenue in New Rochelle, in a big frame house on the Hamilton Avenue again. <laughs> uh, and I went uh, to uh, the New Rochelle High School, which I didn't enjoy again. And at the end of the year, after many experiences in the school, I left that school and I went to Iona, which was a Catholic prep school. Mm -hmm. Spent a year there and the, the brothers were very nice to me. They were very nice. I didn't do well in getting the, 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 to take the, uh, all of the opening tests that one takes before they go into a new school. I was, but I was becoming interested in running. And I was running cross country at uh, Iowa. I was 15, 14, 15, something like that. Maybe a little younger. And it, everything used to cram up. There's so much happening. Well, I stayed in New York. I stayed in New Rochelle for two years, I believe. And my father took an interest in buying land in Vermont. Yeah, at that time, you know, money was went much further than it does today. Oh, uh, sure. I mean, people, you'd see, <coughs> you'd see a farm with 150 acres selling for three thousand dollars, and we moved back to Scarsdale. My mother liked that country. That's where she grew up as a child all through her early life. And her father owned land in Hartsdale, which is right next to Scarsdale. And uh, so I, I kind of was familiar with the land there for you know, a certain time. And my sister and I were very close. And by that time, Annie, my other sister, was born, and she became part of the family. She was born somewhere right after we left Austin. Uh, she was born somewhere in, between there and, and Briarcliff, where we, we ended up. That's just, this is going back a way in the story I'm telling. And he was born. And then Dana was born a little later after that. 
Dana was my brother, a very sensitive fellow, very sensitive and very easily disturbed. And uh, his later his later years were very unhappy. He was never a very assured person. He was a beautiful child, beautiful. I mean, Dana and I'd go fishing, and somebody would pick us up, and they'd say, who's that angel with you, that beautiful blonde little boy? And I'd say, that's my brother. And he, he was really good looking, and you know, just a beautiful child. I believe he was born Dana was the youngest of the family at that time. There was Michael, Juliana, Annie, and Dana. There were four of us. And it was a period when uh, a lot was happening about the war and about the past uh, financial problems that the country had in, uh, on the uh, the whole 30s from the early 30s to the 50s you know the um, and uh, people were still reacting to that whole period then it carried through into the next mm -hmm. decade And I ran into many in my travels and wanderings by myself, usually, into old houses that had been abandoned by wealthy people. Just, they left, they left everything there. Hmm. Amazing places with old cars and swimming pools and big, big, big houses with 15, 20 rooms. Wow. Amazing places. You just wandered through. <clears throat> I couldn't believe it. But it was interesting. Very interesting. This was the life that I was seeing from the past. Right up to I went to Woodward Day School, I remember seeing houses like that. There was some in Rye, too. And uh, so that whole period was kind of had sifted into the war and the war happened. And then after the war, things began to change. People began to make money like they never did before. And uh, everything changed. Yeah, I was brought up in a family that was dying, <coughs> that had once been wealthy and was dying. On both sides, on my father's side and my mother's side, both. We left uh, New Rochelle on the Hamilton Avenue and we moved to Vermont and we bought a big dairy farm in Middlebury, East Middlebury. Uh, my uncle was running the art department at Middlebury College at that time. And I think my mother liked that idea of living near him because she was, hey, that was her brother. Mm -hmm. And Arthur was a good artist. He was a watercolor artist. But he ran the whole program at Middlebury for 30 years. And he used to take me out when he took his students out for painting, and I'd paint along with them. You know, he'd take them to quarries, where we'd paint quarries, which were very attractive places to paint. Mm -hmm with the rock formations and the water and 
the land around. And I was beginning to pick, you know, gather information and, and all that. I liked the natives, I always liked the natives that lived around wherever I lived, whether I lived in Vermont or wherever. I liked the natives of Vermont very much and they were nice people. Mm -hmm. I liked them. The Stowe's were true next door to us in, uh, in uh, East Middlebury. And we raised chickens and pigs. That's all we raised for a year. And I belong to the uh, the 4-H club, or it's one of those uh, clubs that have started for young people mm -hmm. uh, dealing with animals. And uh, yeah, I was a, a, a sophomore the year at uh, Middlebury uh, Public School. We raised a little maple syrup. We got into that. So it was a whole kind of experience for a year of a different life, country life, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, but it was bloody cold, bloody cold. So we were on the edge of the Green Mountains. And uh, I'd go up into the mountains there. I'd find little ponds up in the mountains there. They were far from any other source of water that birds had dropped eggs, fish eggs, hmm. and they were full of trout. Oh. You come back with your knapsack filled with these trout about so big, they're delicious to eat. Mm -hmm. you know? And I learned to uh, shoot grouse up there which were surprisingly very frightening birds because they get up with such a rush. And they, you know, and they, and they were, they were, I mean, you cubbies of 25 grouse. That's a lot of grouse. Mm -hmm. And I got a few of them. And I said, this is a bird I'd like to get more of because they're very good eating. And they were nice. And I... So I spent my summer and winter in Vermont, fishing and hunting most of the time. My father was uh, very generous about his use. I had a good uh, Parker 16, which is a Parker is a fine, fine shotgun. You don't, they don't make them anymore but they're beautiful shotguns. And this was a 16 gauge, and I used that for years. And I shot squirrels and woodchucks and grouse, rabbits. That's about as far as I went. But I love exploring. It's exploring the, the streams, and all that, you know, mm -hmm. and then the streams, the fishing was excellent. And you come back to your limit every time. You mm -hmm. never thought about limits <laughs> in those days. You just fished. Yeah. You know, and there were brown, these are brown trout mostly, browns, natives, uh, rainbows. But uh, that was, the thing. And, you know, I got to know the neighbors and, and all this, seems to have a, a, a certain effect on me in my painting. And I was drawing quite a bit by that time. And I got into some statewide shows at the, uh, in Vermont. And I showed my work there. And uh, I got through that year fine. And at the end of the year, my mother and father had a big disagreement about life and how to live it. My father was quite different than my mother. 
my mother's a practical woman who knew how to do things and how to get things done. My father was a, a dreamer. He was a good writer, excellent, really good writer. He went to Columbia and he was smart, but not, you know, anyway, he wasn't, he couldn't, he couldn't make a good living. He did that, he did carpentry. He was a carpenter at one point and my mother would be embarrassed when she'd go, we'd go to, they would go to parties together. Mm -hmm. And people would ask him what he does. He says, I'm a carpenter. I work at the shipyard. Mm -hmm. He was building a landing craft for Korea at that time. Mm -hmm. My mother loved him very much though, even though she disagreed. And they split up for a year or so. And she moved back to Rye bought a house and uh, started life with us. And he, one day he came back. I heard the crunch, crunch on the driveway as he's walking up and there he was. So it was my dad back, you know, and I loved him. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I was scared of him too, because he had a violent temper. Well, I got through high school. I was a good runner, I was a good miler, and I was a good cross country runner. You know, that was six, seven miles run, you know, with different schools. Mm -hmm. And I was good, more than good. You know, there was a fellow that was in the school with me named Tom Deans. He was a Scotsman, and he was incredible. Incredible. He was running 417, 417, which is 17 seconds from the four minute, uh, which was the thing that everyone was trying to break the four minute mile. Wow, that's fast. <laughs> and I was running about in the mile, I ran 434. Which is pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty fast too, yeah. That's yeah. Really fast. Yeah. And I was a good long distance runner. I was good. I, I had the uh, stamina and the thing to keep, keep going, keep going, keep going. So that was the important part of my high school years. Is the fact that I was a good runner. Mm -hmm. And, uh, not as good as Tom Deans. Tom Deans was incredible. I wonder whatever happened to me. He was a very good friend of mine. Very good, we were very close. He'd come over to my house and sleep over there and have lunch with me. And we'd go out and hang out and do, doing different, doing things. I'd take him hunting. I taught him how to hunt and he'd hunt with me. So Tom Deans was a good part of my life. And of course, I got involved in women right away. And I fell in love with a woman by the name of Scooter Mosley, Sydney Mosley. And I fell in love with her. We finally got married, but that was after I was back from Korea. And the marriage lasted two weeks. Mm. She said, Come and work for my father. She says, I'll see that you're taking well. Well, I says, I don't want to be a, a salesman for Seagram's whiskeys. <laughs> he was vice president of Seagram's whiskeys. So I said, I don't want, I don't want that in my life. I says, I want to pay. And that's what I want to do. So she realized it wasn't going to be a life that she wanted. Mm -hmm. So she said, I want a divorce. And I moved to uh, New York City. And uh, after the, I was after the Korean experience. Uh, 
I moved to New York City on 26th Street and 8th Avenue. And that's where I started my painting career. And I lived in New York for another 12 years. Got married and we had three girls, Christina, Melanie, and Jenny. And we lived up at, uh, near Bard for, uh, oh, I'd say two years, two and a half years. And I finally realized I wasn't going to be able to make much of a living up there. And I was doing odd jobs. I was cleaning windows. I was doing some carpentry, putting fencing up. Painting, a lot of painting. And anyway, we moved back to New York City. And I went to the ad agency and was looking for a job. And I ended up at a school called the Reese School, R E E C E. It was a school for autistic children from wealthy families. Mm -hmm. The school had only 25 students and it had at least 10 teachers. And we ate their lunch and, you know, the school started at eight in the morning and went to 2.30. And that was the day. And then after that, you go do what, you, what else you have to do in life. Mm -hmm. And I was living in the Lower East Side. I'd drive, I'd take the subway from Astor Place uptown to 95th Street. From 95th Street, I'd get off and I'd go, and there the school was, 95th, between Lexington and 3rd. And I worked at that school for five years. And I was liked, and I seemed to handle it all right. Uh, they seemed to like me, and they always wanted me back. And uh, I was good with the children. And uh, I, my, I, my title was really, I was an art, art, expert on that and I'd give slides and I'd talk about different painters and then we'd listen to music in the afternoon and that was the kind of it was a nice day and then we'd take him to Central Park and we'd play for about an hour and then school was over. Well I worked for Dukuni for two years. Uh, that was enough. I, I liked the man very much. He was a very intelligent human being and also a very amusing man at times. He drank a little, drank a little uh, too much uh, at times, which was a big problem. And uh, we always had to be there when he was drinking. We'd keep the bottle away from him. And uh, that wasn't very pleasant at all, that part of the uh, association. But besides that, I have nothing to say ill about Bill the shooting. I thought he was a marvelous man, a marvelous man, really. And I've been with him when he was drunk and when I was drunk and, you know, we had a good relationship. Did he kind of uh, also kind of help catapult your career? Uh, Not really, no. He didn't. Or help you? He, he said, you know, maybe if we do this, you might have a more thing. But he left me alone completely. And at the time, you guys, didn't you have two different painting styles? He was what more abstract expressionism and you were doing landscapes or I was I was, I was doing landscapes when I met him mm -hmm. and I continued doing them for a while until I finally 
realize that my way of working should be abstract. Mm -hmm. And it's just a thing that I discovered in my own nature. And uh, I did buildings and farm buildings and landscapes of all types. I did uh, lots of them. A lot of them outside, and then I did the, usually I did them inside. You know, I just worked from my imagination most of the time. My imagination seems to be a very lively thing. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I worked with him, and I, you know, I before I worked for him, I was painting houses and washing windows and doing all sorts of this and that mm -hmm. to get by. So this was a, a kind of a relief. I worked three days a week and the rest of the time was to myself, to my own studio and all that. And uh, Did you guys uh, ever paint together? Like no, when you were on the, no, no? No, no. He painted in his, in his studio and I painted in mine. I didn't have any association with him in that respect. Uh, he had some women occasionally that came and set up the easels and would work there a few days. Mm -hmm. And they were friends of his and they wanted to, you know, get connected with them that way. And, uh, you know, a lot of it was cleaning brushes and uh, uh, getting canvases ready for him and uh, uh, all that. And, uh, but it wasn't a hard job, uh, and I enjoyed it. It was, you know, steady pay every week. I'd get my ninety-five dollars, mm -hmm. which was enough to get by on in those days. Yeah. And uh, it was back in the early sixties, you know, and so things were much different than financially. And I had a nice studio, and it was comfortable, and my life was very good. Was you, uh, in your studio, was you, was you painting and selling pretty consistently? Was I? Yeah. No. No? I wasn't selling very much at all. I'd sell every once in a while, but that was, that would probably be every six months. Mm hmm You know, it was as long as that. Uh... I did sell them. Uh, I continued working, and finally, when I finally quit working for him, uh, he was he was about 66, 67, 68 mm -hmm. when I left him. And I'm, well, I am what I am. I'm almost 90 now, mm -hmm. so that's, at yeah. the time, I thought he was very old because I, uh, people, one does that. Yeah. Yeah. So what, about how old were you when you started working for him? I guess I was in my late 30, 20s. Late 20s? Yeah, I was probably around 27, 28 years old, maybe almost 30. And he liked your, he liked your painting? Yeah, he liked it. He didn't say too much about it. But he, he never, you know, complimented me or did anything like that. I worked on my own. Mm -hmm. But he respected me. He knew I was serious. Yeah. And uh, he said, he said, you've got three days, at least three days of your own. And every week you can work, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, this should be a pretty good job for you. And it was. You know, I swept the floor, did things, he always made his tea for him, uh -huh. uh, which he drank two or three times a day. And I'd sometimes sit with him and look at his work and make a comment or talk about his work. And uh -huh. I like that was happening. And, this, and uh, that was something we did off and on. And every once in a while, he'd get to talking, and he talked about different situations and people and this and that, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Uh, 
when he was drinking, uh, he was a little different. Mm -hmm. And not that he was belligerent at all. He was just, he, he, he had a brilliant mind and he really, he could talk very well. He was a Dutchman mm -hmm. and he could talk English in his Dutch accent. Yeah. Which was very, uh, was, uh, it used to catch people and if they heard it enough, after a while they'd start talking like the Cooney. Yeah. I didn't know. I mean, I knew that I, I knew that he was from Europe, but I didn't know that, like he, had, he actually lived there for, you know, or knew the language. I guess from what I'm trying to say. Well, he lived in Amsterdam. Yeah. And he worked for a, a company or a, a paint uh, thing that taught people how to paint. Mm -hmm. And in Europe. When you do that, you learn everything. Yeah. You learn finishes, you learn wood finishes, how to do all sorts of different ways because the art business is quite large in mm -hmm. different ways. And you have to know how to do it, you know, using different techniques. But he had a good solid thing. He worked about six years, six or seven years in the school. And I, of course, I didn't know him then. I didn't, he was a young man then. And so that was really my life. And his uh, girlfriend, or his mistress, Joan Ward, uh, they hardly talked to, at all with each other, even though he had a child by her, mm -hmm. his daughter Lisa, which looked very much like him, very Dutch-looking. And good looking girl. And uh, so Lisa grew up with my daughter, which was the same age. They were born about the same time, so they were about the same age. And regrettably, uh, Lisa died of a heart attack about five years ago mm. from this day, from my day now to when she died. And uh, I was very surprised. But she lived a hard life. I mean, she did a lot of drugs. And yeah. And drank a lot. And it all took its toll on her. And really, that's all I really could say about Bill. Uh, oh, he was more of a teacher than the art school I went to. Oh, yeah? Much more. Huh, well, that's that's good. Yeah, I mean, I just watched him. And I said, here's a man, and he worked. He worked. He really worked. And I was very respectful of that work ethic he had. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went on to live, and I lived in East Hampton for about 10 years. And then uh, Daisy and I had a difference of opinion about life and this and that. We split up, but we didn't. We were always friends. We were always friends, mm -hmm. and we were. And I think we both loved each other still. And uh, I met a woman in Cambridge, New York, and Cambridge, Massachusetts, who was very bright. He was a lawyer. Mm. I didn't know it when I met her, but I found out soon enough. And I ended up moving up with her. She wanted me to come up to Cambridge and live with her. Wow, she made so much effort about that. And I finally did. And that changed my life. Mm -hmm. You know, it was uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. It was quite different from East Hampton, Rhode Island. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, it was it was more intellectual, uh, and of course you had Harvard there, mm -hmm. and uh, you're right around Harvard. And, and you continued to paint this whole time. Oh yeah, I, I painted in her house for a while in the upstairs until I found found a studio of my own, which I. That, and that was my place of work. It was a nice studio. It was an old beacon wax factory. 
Mm, I bet that was big then. It was big. Yeah, it had a big skylight in the center of the room. So I had lots of light. So how long did you live up there? I lived there. I lived with her for 14 years. Oh, wow. We finally got a place in New Hampshire in the country. And that's where I lived. I didn't live in the house in, in, New, in Cambridge. I used to, but I didn't. And I moved up there, and she'd come up on weekends. Uh -huh. And I built, I took the barn, the, it was a small barn on the property, it was kind of a garage barn. Uh -huh. And I made a studio out of it. And that was, that was where I was working, and I continued to work there. You know, doing my per very personal work, uh, not really abstract altogether, but getting closer and I don't know whether abstract is just right kind word. of experimenting yeah. where you fell in yeah yeah and uh, I sold a little bit I was for decorators there around there and I, they met me and I sold some work to them and they liked me you were never married you just we never got married no. okay we just lived together she uh she was married to the Wassermans, who were very well known in Washington. Mm -hmm. At the time, they owned the Washington Post. Oh, wow. And so they were very um, important people in her life. And she kept a relationship going with them. And she knew people like uh, Updike, who was a writer, mm -hmm. a very well known writer. Nice guy. I met him, and he was very nice. He actually he wanted to buy one of my paintings, but she didn't want to sell one of my paintings. <laughs> so I never sold it to him. And I met people like that, which were uh, very important in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I lived I lived in Cambridge with uh, what Sally 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 yeah Sally her name was, at the time was Sally Watson. But she changed her name to Landis about since we were together for about ten years at that point, and she changed her name. Hmm. You know, she had a, a little depressive quality, yeah, which was uh, something that was in her mind, I guess. And uh, I was always trying to cheer her up. And we traveled a great deal. We went to Mexico, we went everywhere. And she was a good traveler. Great driver. And we shared her in the driving and we'd take off. Uh, fine woman, fine woman. Really fine, very bright. Good lawyer. And then... Uh, well, I left, I, I was there for 14 years in the end. It was, uh, it was falling apart at the end of 14 years. Uh -huh. And not, not that she didn't love me, but she was seeing somebody else also at that time. And I said, I don't want that relationship. And so I said, I'm, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to go to uh, New Mexico. So that's what brought you here to New Mexico? Yeah. Santa Fe? Yeah. And you've been here for since '86, which is about thirty some odd years. Yeah. Yeah, thirty-five, forty years, thirty something. Yeah. For a while. And you've got your own little studio here that you still paint. You still paint in. Yeah, I had, I've had four studios since I've been in Santa Fe. I built, had to build them all. Hmm. But I had my own studio. I always had a place to work. That's good. That's important. Yeah, it's very important. And uh, but I lived here and there. And, and I had a few girlfriends. Uh, some of them, the relationships were very good. And others were not so good. Mm -hmm. But that happens in life. And you've got family up here, that's kind of what made you... Well, yes, I got my nephews here, which is uh, my sister's son. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
he was here, and he he's helped me a great deal since I've been here. He's a wonderful man, very bright, very nice man. He's like his father. He's very tall. He's six five. Mm, that is tall. <laughs> and he weighs two hundred and eighty pounds. He's big guy, big yeah. Big and heavy. <laughs> yeah, that's a big guy. His legs are like this. You look at his legs. I look at my legs and they're like God. <laughs> I'm nothing. <laughs> and this yeah. guy's got arms. I mean, just just giant. Mm -hmm. Well, he, not, he very he, nice man. Very good looking too. His father was the same way. His father was a an architect. He went to Princeton. Justin never went to to college. Hmm. Picked it all up on his own. Everything he said, I can do it on my own. I'll find out. Yeah, and he did. That's a. I think that's one of the best ways to learn is just experiencing it. Well, that's the way I did too. Mm -hmm. uh, you, 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 know, you. Going to getting an education is makes it easier. Mm -hmm. It really does. Doors open up for you. Yeah, yeah. As and far as yeah. as far as job opportunities stuff like yeah. that. But you're more likely to remember something if you if you learned it by experience versus being taught it. In my opinion. Yeah, yeah, that could be true. Like there's a diff there's a difference in saying somebody telling me don't stick your finger in a light socket you'll get electrocuted but if i did it i guarantee i would remember it not to do it again <laughs> yeah. but right. yeah well I, I lived up in new hampshire and i finally left that place and god uh, when we sold it and judy uh sally put most of the money down on the house i didn't have the money for it mm -hmm. And the house wasn't an enormous amount of money. We bought it for twenty seven twenty seven thousand dollars. And we sold it for a hundred and something. Mm. Yeah. Wow, the property value must have skyrocketed in that time. Crazy. It, you know, but it was on its way up when we she sold yeah. it. And it would have it would have probably gone up to twice that. Mm -hmm. And so I lived there, I lived there, I made some good friends in New Hampshire. And I still have them as friends. And they call me up every once in a while or I call them up. And we keep in contact with the people I met in New Hampshire. And I raised, I supported myself by raising uh, grass, growing marijuana. Mm. And that was a deal. That, uh, to kind of make ends meet with your art. Yeah, you know, well, I had to have some way of making money. Yeah, you definitely. Know? I mean, I can't expect Sally to pay for me, take care of me all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, she's got a family of her own. Right. And, you know, two children, uh, which were growing up very fast. Uh, two girls, as I had three girls. And uh, I had the same problem there with children that. I had when I had uh, uh, Daisy. Mm -hmm. I mean, the children get very angry that you're living with another woman and living with other children. Yeah. Which they thought they should be living with you. Yeah, understandable. Yeah. So there was a lot of pressure on that thing. Uh, that's all been forgiven and forgotten about me. My first wife was uh, very damaging that way. She really put me down with the children. Yeah. For years. Uh, you know, that I was a drunk and I was, you know, I didn't, whatever, have everything you could think of. But really, the, mar the marriage just started to fall apart. Mm -hmm. I mean, both of us were playing around. Right. And we were losing our. The. the, the reliability we had with each other. Um, and uh, So you've been here 30 plus years in this studio and still painting pretty much every day. Yeah. I'm pro probably painting more right now than I painted in my mid-age. Mid, uh, 
uh, probably better. Because I can't go, I used to go hunting and fishing occasionally. Mm -hmm. It was a, a good thing for me to do. But I can't do those things anymore. It's right. too active for me. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, almost 90, I mean, I'm super, a lot of people don't even make it, you know, that, and, and to be painting, getting up every day, and even just painting, yeah. you know, it's still that, that still uh, shows that you're really dedicated to, to your painting career. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, well, you know, we never know what, it's going to happen. I don't know. I mean, here I am at my age. I'm I'm going. To, I'm painting longer than uh, Bill did even. Mm -hmm. By ninety, Bill was in med most of the time. We had a nurse watching him all the time. Yeah. You know, he was sick a great deal of the time in the late late in his life. You think maybe his lifestyle kind of caught up with him? Po yeah, possibly. Yeah. But at ninety four. Dying in 94. Oh, yeah. Okay, I didn't know he was that old when he died. Yeah. That's that's pretty good. That's pretty he good. Was a pretty very good vibe. Strong, tough little guy. Yeah. He wasn't tall. He was only 5'6. Yeah. This is short. Much shorter than me. Mm hmm. That's strong as hell. You know. Okay. Well, I'll take a look at your gallery and kind of show the people uh, some of your paintings that you got here in the gallery. And, uh, yeah, okay. We'll wrap it up and I'll put this on on YouTube for any artist to see anytime they want for yeah. as long as the internet's around. So. All right, <laughs> okay. All right, so this has been an interview with Michael Wright. And Michael Fitzhugh Wright. Yep. I can't pronounce that, so I'm glad he said it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Here is Michael Wright's gallery. He's got several paintings. Some drawings. Very good artist. He takes it very, very serious. And sometimes it takes him, you know, months to uh, complete a painting. He will actually start one and sit back and look at it often and see if it's done. And he's got a lot of paintings. Well, he's got a fairly big gallery with some tools for stretching. Some more paintings here, there, and even up there, along with about 200 in his garage.